Tony Martinetti, Nonprofit Radio, big nonprofit ideas for the other 95%. I'm your aptly named host. This is a special episode of Nonprofit Radio to help you be the change around racism and white privilege. Your dismantling racism journey, picking up from our last special episode, starting with your people, your culture, and your leadership, How do you identify, talk about, and begin to break down inequitable structures in your nonprofit? My guest is Pratichi Shah, founder and CEO at Flourish Talent Management Solutions. We're sponsored by Wegner CPAs, guiding you beyond the numbers, wegnercpas.com. By Cougar Mountain Software, Denali Fund is their complete accounting solution made for nonprofits tony.ma slash Cougar Mountain for a free 60-day trial. And by Turn2 Communications, PR and content for nonprofits. Your story is their mission, turn-2.co. It's a real pleasure to welcome, welcome, I'm not welcoming, I'm welcoming, I'm welcoming Pratichi Shah. She's an HR strategist and thought leader with 25 years experience in all aspects of talent management. She's making a face when I say 25 years. Um, Human resources, equity and inclusion, and organizational development in the nonprofit and for-profit arenas. She's founder and CEO of Flourish Talent Management Solutions. The company is at flourishtms.com. Pratichi, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate being here. Oh, it's a pleasure. Pleasure to have you. Um, and I'd like to jump right in if you're, if you're ready. Um, Absolutely. You know, um, racism and white privilege uh, most often look very benign on their face. Um, I had a guest explain why use of the word professional in a job description is racist. I had a more recently, I had a guest explain how not listing a salary range in a job description was felt racist to them. So how do we begin to uncover what is inequitable and right under our noses, yet not visible on its face? Hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it often, it starts with listening. I mean, to state, state a bit of the obvious, it really does start with listening. It's understanding for our organizations, it's understanding where we are. Um, so it's listening to the voices that may not have been centered. We've become better as organizations and being responsive to staff. I hear that a lot, kind of, hey, this is what my staff is telling me, this is what we need to do. But the question is, is are you responding to the voices that have possibly been marginalized, likely been marginalized or oppressed? in the past. General responsiveness is not the same as centering the voices that really need to be heard. So it's first off just understanding where you are as an organization and listening to the people who may have experienced your organization in a way that is different than you think. Yeah. So when you say general responsiveness is is not what not adequate, not what we're looking for, what, what do you mean by that? So a lot of time, the voices that are saying, hey, something's wrong, or we need to do this, or we need to do that, um, are not the voices of those that have been marginalized and oppressed. They tend to be maybe the loudest voices. They're speaking maybe from a place of privilege, and that needs to be taken into account. So being responsive, for instance, if the, I call it kind of the, the almond milk issue, being responsive to a staff that says, in addition to dairy milk for our coffee, this is back when we were in physical offices, um, we need almond milk too. But the question is, is, are we listening to the voices of those that weren't able to consume the dairy milk? It's not a perfect metaphor. It's not a perfect analogy because that one ignores actual pain and it just talks about preference. But are we listening to the voices of people that have been oppressed, who have, who have, been, who have heard the word professional or professionalism wielded against them as, a, as an obstacle in their path to success? in their path to career advancement. Those are the voices that we need to listen to, not the ones who have a preference for one thing or another. Okay, um, let, let's be explicit about how we identify who, who holds these voices, who are these people? 
It's people that have, have come from, it's particularly right now when we talk about anti-Black racism, we need to center the voices of those from the Black community. And that means those who have either maybe not joined, not just not joined our organization for particular reasons, but maybe they have not joined our board. Maybe they have not participated in our programs. Maybe they haven't had the chance to. So it's really from an organizational perspective, think of it as understanding what our current state is. So how does your organization move people up, move people in, move people out? If, if we don't have the voices in the first place, because maybe we're not as welcoming as we should be, then what does the data tell us about who's coming into our organization, who's leaving our organization, who's able to move up into our organization, what our leadership looks like, what our board looks like. So at times, the fact that there is an absence of voice is telling in and of itself. And our data needs to be able to explain what is going on. So that data needs to be looked at as well. All right, so we need to very, well, good chance. We need to look outside our organization. You're talking about people that we've turned down for board, uh, board positions, turned down for employment. Um, I'm not even gonna say turned down for promotion because that would presume that they're still, that, that presumes they're still in the organization. But I'm talking about very likely going outside the organization. People who don't work with us, who aren't volunteering, uh, who aren't supporting us in any way, but we've marginalized them, we've cast them out before they even had a chance to get in. Potentially, but, yeah. And, yeah, and actually probably. Probably there is something that they have not found palatable or appealing about working with us or being a sponsor or being, uh, to your point, a volunteer. So we need, we need to look at why that's happening. Okay, I've got to, I've got to drill down even further. How are we going to identify these people within, within our organization as it is? How are we going to figure out which people these are that we've marginalized, these voices of color, um, over the, let's just pick like in the past five years, what have we, if we've done this, how do we identify the people we've done it to? Yeah, it, you know, because it's a really, it's a complicated question. It will differ by organization, right? It differs by what your subsector is, how things flow within a subsector, the size of the organization. A really good place to start is understanding who has turned us down. Why have people left? So take a look at exit interviews. Even if you're not doing exit interviews, we know that there is not always uh, an HR presence in a lot of our organizations. If there aren't formal exit interviews, first of all, let's make time for those because we need to understand why people are leaving. Um, but if, if there isn't a formal HR presence, what do we know about the circumstances under which someone left our organization or said no to a job offer? or said no to a board position or a volunteer, it's also important to ask expanding our definition of stakeholder groups, engaging with all of our stakeholder groups as, as broadly defined as possible and within those groups, understanding are we reaching out to a diverse audience to say, why would you engage with us? Why would you not engage with us in any of those roles? So yeah, it's, a, it's gonna be a little bit harder to understand the people who are not there because they're not there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, all right. Um, we go through this exercise and, and we identify, we've, we've identified a dozen people. Um, they're not total, they're not currently connected to us. And uh, it, it may be that they have had a bad experience with us. Now mm -hmm. they, they may have turned us down for employment because they got offered more money somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, that could, that in itself could be, all right, let's, right. Let's, right. Right, that, that in itself could be uh, not, something other than benign. Um, but let's say they moved out of the state. You know, they were, they were thinking about, so, so in some cases, they may not have a bad, have had a bad experience with us, but in, but in lots of cases they may have, they may have turned down that board position because they saw the current composition of the board and they didn't feel that they, they felt like uh, maybe being an offer, uh, you know, a, a, a token slot or right. whatever, whatever it might be. I'm just, I'm just suggesting that, some of the some of the uh, feelings toward the organization might not be negative, uh, but some might very well be negative. Of these dozen people we've identified in all these different stakeholder or potential stakeholder roles that that they could have had, um, what do we reach out to them and say? How do we yeah. how do we get them to join a conversation 
with an organization that they may feel uh, unwelcome in? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think right now, especially, we tread carefully. Um, we tread carefully and we honor the fact that they, in fact, might be getting that same question from many other, other organizations, friends, colleagues, family members in which people want to understand something. What we're seeking to do is not be educated on the overall picture of white privilege, white supremacy, of a dominant narrative and dominant culture. That's on us. That's on all of us individually to understand that. That is not the mem that is not up to the member of oppressed society yeah, to have to tell us that. Policies. Right. So what they what we want to understand is kind of what did you experience with our organization? What was the good? What was the bad? And first of all, do you even want to engage with us? Is this not a good time to do that because you're already exhausted? I said to a, a colleague recently, you know, we can't even understand the reality of what it's like to live the rea to live that reality and for many to lead the charge. Right, because they're also showing leadership in the movement. So to, to, we can't even understand what those layers of existence are like. So I think it's very, treading very carefully. And should we have the ability to engage with someone because they have the space, the energy, the desire, then I think it's understanding and asking kind of what's going on for us. What, where did you find us either not appealing or where did you, why did you not want to work with us in whatever capacity we were asking? And it's asking that question. Okay, well, that's further down, right? I'm, I'm just trying to get to like, what's the initial email invitation look like? It depends on the organization. It depends on the organization. It depends on the relationship. I wouldn't presume to give words to that, to be honest with you, because, yeah, yeah. because I think it also depends on the person that you're asking. I don't want to offer kind of a blanket yeah, response yeah, and right. inadvertently tokenize people by saying, oh, of course you're going to want to engage with us. So I really think it's dependent on the situation. Okay. And, and what are you inviting them to do with you? have a conversation, share your experience with us? Is it? Yeah, essentially, I mean, that's what it boils down to. But again, it really depends on what the organization is, right? So this is your data collection moment. This is information collection. Uh -huh. Where else are you collecting information? What, what else do you know? What other steps have you taken to begin that educational process? Because there's, there's kind of a, a dual purpose here, right? It's understanding who we are in where we have contributed to structural racism, to pretend to a culture that does not support differing viewpoints, differing populations, that is in some ways upholding white supremacy or is completely holding upholding white supremacy in its culture. There's that general education of understanding all of that. And then there's understanding what our organization's role is, right? So it's both and. Um, so it's really highly dependent upon where is the organization uh, Kay Suarez, who you've talked to, um, the head of equity in the center, describes a cycle that is brilliant um, around awake to woke to work. Where are you in that cycle? Are you, where are you on, um, a, where are you in being pluralistic? Where are you in being inclusive? All of those things depend on what you'll ask and how you'll reach out and if you even should reach out. There may be work that is to be done internally before that reach out can happen. Again, just being considerate and sensitive of those who are willing to talk to you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Kay was our guest for the, uh, the last, uh, most recent special episode on this exact same subject. Thank you. She yeah, the, the organization is doing, and it has been since its inception, has been doing incredible work. Kay is leading that work um, and, and both her words always contain wisdom and the products that they've put out are extraordinary. Now, how about in your work? Uh, are you facilitating the kinds of conversations in your practice that, that you and I are talking about right now? Do you, do you bring these outside folks in sometimes to, to, yeah, to have these conversations? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Again, being highly respectful of if they didn't want to engage with us, do they even want to talk to us right now? My work really is around um, uh, having an organization understand where it is right now. So what is its current state? What is the desired future state, right? So we know that we want to be a racially inclusive, racially equitable organization. Likely that's already been defined, but what does that mean for us as an organization? If it means solely a numbers piece, right? Like we want to be more diverse as a board. Okay, that's fine. But beyond that, how will we make ourselves 
have a board culture that is appealing to those people that we want to bring in to work with us. So it's kind of defining both current state and understanding current state, defining future state, and then developing the strategy to get there. Okay. And now you and I are talking about, you said, you know, we're still data gathering. So we're still defining the current culture as it exists. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Okay. And your work, you, you center it around uh, people, culture, and leadership. Mm -hmm. Can we focus on leadership? I feel like everything trickles down from there. Very true. No, I don't know. Are we okay? Are you okay starting with a leadership conversation or you'd rather start somewhere else? No, we can, we can start there. That's absolutely okay. fine. Okay. Um, so what is, what is it we're looking for leaders of our listeners of small and mid-sized nonprofits uh, to, to commit to? I think it's first of all, committing to their own learning. And, and not relying on communities of color to provide that learning, right? And again, going back to what we said earlier, it's not relying on those who have been harmed or oppressed yeah. to provide the learning. Uh, so first of all, it's an individual journey. That's a given. Okay. Um, what, can I, can I, I, I like to, <laughs> I like yeah. to put down things like people, I, I like action steps. Like that people, okay. okay. So when we're talking about our individual journey, our own learning, I mean, I've been doing some of this recently by watching YouTube, uh, watching, um, folks on YouTube, uh, of course, now I, now I can't remember the names of people, but no, Eddie Glaude. Um, uh, so Eddie Glaude is a commentator on MSNBC. Uh, he's just written, a, uh, just released this last week, uh, a biography, well, not so much a biography, of uh, James Baldwin, but, uh, but an explanation of Baldwin's journey around racism. Um, so that's one example of you know, who I've been listening to. So, but, so we're talking about educating, like learning from thought leaders around yeah. privileged structures, whether it's reading books, listening to podcasts. Absolutely. Videos, it's, it's, right? around, it's around structures, but it's also um, understanding things that we do all the time in organizations and how I, as a leader, might perpetuate those, right? So it's sometimes the use of language, to your point about the use of the word professional. Um, language tends to create our realities, so, and, and it either language will build a bridge or not. So how do we use our language? How do we use our descriptors? How do I show up as a leader um, as in my own kind of inclusion or not? So I think it is absolutely that. It is looking at thought leaders around things like structural racism, around the use of language, um, around people's individual experiences to get that insight and depth because it's not just an intellectual exercise. This is emotional too, and therefore has to have emotional resonance. Okay. Thank you for letting me d dive deeper into what. Absolutely. What about, about personal, you know, your own personal journey, your own personal education, uh, fact finding, and and introspection. I mean, you're talking about something, you know, and it's, it's no no revelation. This is it's difficult stuff. It's painful. You know, you you you're very likely uncovering how you offended someone, uh, uh, how you offended a a, a group. Um, if you were, you know, speaking in public and you, something comes to mind or how you offended someone in meetings or, you know, multiplied, I don't know how many times. I mean, it, this introspection is likely painful. Likely. Yeah. Likely. Yeah. More often, more often than not. I, I can't, I can't really envision it not at some level being painful. Yeah. But you've caused pain, you know, and that, there's a recognition there yeah. too. You know, you've, yeah. Exactly. Yes, it's painful for you, but let's consider the pain of the person or the group that you uh, exactly right. I don't know, offended, stereotyped, memed, put off. You know, whatever it is, you're. That's right, and that that's why the work. As much as I know, you know, to some degree, people want this to be work that can be kind of project managed, if you will, or it can be put into a process or a series of best practices or benchmarks. Yeah. To some degree, not very much, but to some degree, yes, absolutely. The, the, some, a little bit of that can happen, but that in and of itself is a bit of a dominant narrative, right? That in and of itself is kind of that, that centering white culture. So I, I think what we need to understand is this is not just going to be, again, to, to, sorry to be redundant, but it's not just gonna be intellectual. The, the fact that pain has been caused 
dictates that this be emotionally owned as well. It can't be arm's length. It can't be just intellectually owned with a project plan that I keep over here on a chalkboard or something like that. Emotionally owned. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, all right, so I made you digress deep into something. What else, what else do you want to tell us about leadership's commitment? And, and, and the importance of, of leadership commitment. Yeah, so, so it needs to be explicit. It needs to be authentic. It needs to be um, baked into the leadership, whatever leadership structure the organization has, it needs to be an ongoing piece of that leadership. So it's not a, hey, let's touch base on our quote inclusion initiative. If it's an initiative, first of all, that's not really doing the work anyway. Um, but it's not something that lives separately from ourselves. Let's have HR kind of check in on this or let's have the operations person check in on this. That, that's not what this is about. It's really, it's authentically being owned by leadership to say, yeah, I know it's gonna be painful. And in looking at our organization, we're gonna need to understand why our leadership is remarkably homogeneous, which in the case of many nonprofits, it is. If you take a look at Building Movement Project and the unbelievably great work that they've done twice now, they just put out an update to their um, leadership work around how people move through the sector or don't, and how people, communities of color and people of color are represented in our leadership. We can uh, begin to understand that by and large, they're, they're not. Um, Though I, that is a, an oversimplification in some ways, so I would encourage people to go to Building Movement Project's website and check out their work. Um, but you know what? Why are we so homogeneous? Why is our board so homogeneous? It's it's also unpacking and uncovering that. So to your point earlier about you know how do we look at people and how they move through the organization? This is where you look at who is present, right? Not just who's not with us, but who is with us. How do people get? promoted? How does that system work? Does any, does everyone have the same information? Is it a case of unwritten rules? Is it a case of some people move up because they're similar or they have 10 years of experience, which is something that we like to say? How do you get 10 years of experience if you've not been given those chances to begin with? So is there a life experience that we can that we can begin to integrate in our conversations? Because life experience is equally valuable. Are we putting too much of a premium on higher education, education in its formal kind of traditional form? Are we putting too much of a of an emphasis on pedigree of other kinds of those those are the things that ultimately keep people out so taking a look at leadership and and having leadership commitment ultimately means looking at all of those things there's an overlap in how we look at leadership or people and or sure. organizational culture yeah yeah of course this is a it's a continuum or absolutely absolutely and the areas bleed yeah. into each yeah. other yeah of course yeah um you know, I, it's subsumed in all this, I guess, I mean, it's okay for leaders to say, I don't know where the, where the journey is going. I don't know what we're going to uncover, but I'm committed to having this journey and leading it and, and right. I mean, supporting it, but I don't know what we're going to find. Uh, right. Okay. Right. Right. And that in and of itself can be uncomfortable for a right. lot of people. And that's the, that's the kind of discomfort we need to get okay with. Yeah. All right. Yeah, this, you know, I had, I had a guest explain that you know, this is not, as you were alluding to, uh, it's not the kind of thing that, you know, we're gonna have a weekly meeting, and there'll be these outcomes at the end of every meeting, right? And then we'll right. have this list of activities. And you know, the then, the, you know, it's, how come it's not like that? How come we can't do it like that? Because we're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of years of, of history, yeah, and it's yeah. because we haven't been inclusive in the ways that we do things, and we haven't allowed whole selves to show up. That it is, um, it's, it's complicated and it's messy because it's human. All right, so it's not going to be as simple as our budget meetings. <laughs> as, to the extent, right? Yeah. Absolutely, a, diff no, a that, different kind of hard. All right, and that we're going to have an outcome at every at every juncture, at every step, right. or every week, or every month, or something. Yeah, right. that's right. All right. That's right. And if we expect it to go that way, um, we are likely going to give ourselves excuses not to press on. All right. So that's what it's not. What what does it look like? 
Oh, it, it, it absolutely looks different for every organization. Okay. It absolutely looks different for every organization. And that's why it's so critical to understand kind of where are we right now? Um, where are we as far as all of the components of our organization? Right. So vol again, volunteers, board, staff, culture. You said, you know, we, we were talking about people, organization and leadership, which is obviously a lot of my work. Um, it is getting underneath all of those kinds of things to say, so who experiences our culture? How? Um, so we do engagement surveys, right? A lot of times we do engagement employee surveys, that kind of thing. Are we looking at those disaggregate in a disaggregated way? Are we asking different populations to identify themselves? And are we looking at what the experiences are by population? Are we asking explicit questions around whether or not you feel like you can be yourself in this organization, whether you can provide dissenting opinions, whether you feel comfortable approaching your boss with feedback? Um, whether you feel comfortable volunteering for particular work, whether you feel like you understand what a promotion or performance management process is, whether you get the support that you need or to what extent you get support that you need either from colleagues, boss, leadership, et cetera. So it's looking at all of those things and then understanding, are they being experienced differently by different communities within our organization? You mentioned disaggregating. That, that's where the data is not helpful, right? That is where we look at the data in terms of populations. Oh, oh, aggregate. Oh, of course, aggregating. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, you're stuck with a lackluster host. No, of course. Yes, it's, aggregating. <laughs> it's early in the week. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, thank you. You couldn't say early in the day, but thank you for being gracious. Okay. Yes, we uh, we uh, we want to uh, disaggregate, of course, um, and look by population, and and I guess cut a different way. I mean, depending on the size of the organization. Um, age, race, uh, age, know, race, weird. ethnicity, um, a physical ability, orientation, all of those need to be in the mix. Um, gender as well, including gender fluidity. So really looking at all of our populations and then understanding, you know, for these particular questions, is there a difference in how people experience our organization? We, we know then what we do know is that if there is a difference, that there is a difference. We don't know that there is causality unless there, unless you've asked questions that might begin to illuminate that, right? But there's, there's always that difference between correlation and causality. And then what you want to do is get underneath that to understand why the experience might be different and why it might change along lines of gender or uh, race or ethnicity or orientation or physical ability. We uh, we we wandered, you know, but I, that's that's fine. I, I love it's it. It's all part of the people and organization yeah. parts. People, culture, and uh, and leadership all coming together. Um, exactly. Where 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 do you want to go? Uh, I mean, I would like to talk about people, culture, and leadership. What, what what's a good what's a good next one? Yes. Well, so so this is what you're doing, right? Is you're you're collecting information in all of those three areas. Right, and one, so a, a couple of things that I would add to that is when you look at people, you're looking at their experiences. When you look at leadership, you're looking at commitment, makeup, structure, access, all of those kinds of things. When you're looking at culture, you're looking at how people experience the culture, right? And so what, what is happening, what's not happening, what's stated out loud, what's not stated out loud, what are the unwritten rules? There is also the piece or that, that forms all of these things, which is operational systems, right? So things like performance management, things like um, where people may sit back when we were in physical offices, at having access to technology, all of those kinds of things, particularly important now that we're not in physical offices. So does everyone have access to the technology and information necessary to do their, to do their jobs, to do their work? So it is looking also at your operational side and saying, how do we live our operational life? How do, how do people experience it? Who do we engage with to provide services for our operations? How do we provide the services, if you will, for lack of a better term, to our employees? So it's also looking at that because operations ultimately permeates organizational culture, people, and leadership, right? Because it, it kind of sustains all of that. Mm. So taking a look at that too. And finally, I would suggest, again, as part of this and as a wraparound, is what is the internal external alignment? Right, so I often hear people say, hey, you know what, this is the subsector we work in. People would think that we're really equitable. 
but internally we are living a different life than what we are putting out to our stakeholders and our constituencies externally. So what is, what is our external life and how does that need to inform our internal world? It's not unusual for me to hear that the external life, the way we engage with stakeholders or the way we put out program, programmatic work is actually maybe further along to the extent that this is considered to be a continuum, it's further along than the way that we're living our life internally. So there's a right? dishonesty there, a, dis a disconnect at, at there's a disconnect. At best, there's a, a disconnect, disconnect for right? sure, and possibly, yeah, dishonesty and maybe even hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah. All right, but again, all right. So that now we're looking like this is organizational introspection. Exactly. So there's there's individual learning and introspection. Now we're at the organizational level. Right. Being honest with our with our culture and our messaging. Right. Right. And, and so what I try to do is to help organizations kind of look at those things and decide how we might evolve, given the future that we've set our sights on and given some of the, the principles that we've laid out. Um, how do we kind of get there? How do we, uh, how do we evolve our systems? How do we evolve our people practices? How do we evolve our culture? So hence the need to look at all of these things that centered around people, culture, and leadership. What about the use of a professional, a facilitator? Because, well, first of all, there's a body of expertise that someone like you brings, uh, but also help with these difficult conversations. Talk about the value of having an, uh, an expert facilitator. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, I think I think there's always a level of objectivity and and, and kind of an in, inside look by an outsider that you that you benefit from. We go to experts for everything from, you know, our health uh, to the extent that we have access to those experts, which is a whole different conversation right. on on race and oppression. Um, we we want that external voice. What I would say is it's likely not going to be the same expert or the same facilitator, and I say expert in quotes, um, for everything. So for instance, I am not the voice to be centered on educating an organization around structural racism. I don't think I'm the right voice to be centered. I would rather center voices like those at, um, at Race Forward, at Equity in the Center, at those who have lived the results of 400 years of oppression. So you might want to call in someone for that discussion, for that education. There are people that are better and more steeped in that and whose voices should absolutely be centered for that. Um, you might want to call in a voice for white allyship uh, because there is some specifics around that that we need to talk about without kind of centering white voices. Was, I'm sorry, that was white allyship? Yeah. What, what, what is that? So if we think about the, or the organization, right, and our kind of culture and our people, um, who, who on staff sees themselves as an ally and how can they be good, how can, how can white people be good allies? Right, and how do we, how do we further in, embed that in the culture, um, and then finally, so keeping that in mind that, that there are going to be different experts or different facilitators for different things, you know, who is going to be the person? In my case, this actually might be me, is to help us evolve our culture and our systems so that we can be more equitable and take a look at that. Who's going to provide the training? Because there are skills necessary, right, to have these conversations. There are foundational communication skills. There is the ability to give feedback. Um, there is the ability to communicate across cultures, across genders, across across groups. There is ability to be collaborative. So, so also strengthening those skills while we continue to look at those things. But to think that all of this help is going to come from one source is not ideal and, and likely is even inappropriate because everyone can't be everything. I, I don't try to be the voices that I can't be. It's inappropriate for me to do that. What, um, what else do you want to, what do you want to talk about? You know, given the level where, that we're at, we're, we're trying to help small and mid-sized nonprofits inaugurate a, a journey yeah. around racism and white privilege. Yeah. I think, I mean, look, first of all, I, I hear a lot of organizations say, like, what, what is the access point? Like, what do I get started doing? We put out a statement. Um, in some cases, 
we are experiencing some dissonance between the statement that we put out or the programmatic work that we do and the way that we're living internally. So it is really understanding kind of where are we now through all of the ways that, that we've been talking about over the last several minutes. Where are we now? What is it that we're not doing that we should be doing? What is it that we need to be doing? How do we define for us, if we have an equitable culture, if we are living racial equity, what does that look like for us? Um, how does that affect our programmatic work? How does that affect our operations? Everything from our finances to our people processes, to when we are back in an office, even our physical setup, how, how does that affect us and how would we define that future state? So it's understanding what is my current state, what is my future state, and then understanding how we get there. And it's likely gonna be along all of the areas that we said, right? So individual journeys, some group and individual skill building, um, some evolution of our systems, and some understanding of kind of how we can support each other and support ourselves for those that are that affiliate with a particular group um, and then kind of moving us along to that place of where we want to be so it is it is understanding where you are that determines what your access point is but i would say if you if you have done the work of putting out the statement then there then look for look for where you're not living that statement internally that sounds like a very good place to, yeah, to start your search for, for an access point because it's so recent. Your organization has probably said something in the past five, six weeks. Absolutely. And, and how and close are you hewing to that, to that statement? Exactly. And, and we are incredibly, I would say, and pardon the use of the term, but almost fortunate that so many thought leaders have been kind and generous enough to share with us their thoughts on this moment. So not just within the sector, but all the way across our society, so many people have taken the time and the patience and the generosity amidst everything else that they're living through. They've agreed to share their thoughts, their leadership, their expertise with us. So there is a ton of knowledge out there right at our fingertips. Yeah. And that's, a, that's another really great place to start and to center the voices that most need to be heard. At the same time, you know, we are seeing beginnings of change. Uh, institutions from Princeton University to the state of Mississippi. Right, right absolutely. They're, to they're hopefully, uh, you know, the unnamed Washington football team and right. to NASCAR exactly. and places where we, I didn't know that change necessarily was possible, but we, we are seeing change. And, and the important thing is, is to not be complacent about that change. Right. And not, and also recognize that it's just a beginning, you know, removing Confederate statues, um, taking old glory off the, the Mississippi flag. These are just beginnings, but, but That's right. I think worth, worth noting, I mean, worth recognizing and celebrating because you know, the state of Mississippi is a big institution. And yeah. it's been wrestling with this for, I don't know if they've been wrestling for centuries, but that flag has been there for that, just that long. Right. 18 somethings, I think, is when that flag was developed. So it's been a long, it's been a long time coming. So recognizing it for what it is mm -hmm. and celebrating it, you know, to the extent that, the, yeah, to the extent that it represents the change. Yeah. Uh, the, beginning of, the beginning of change. All right. All right. Um, well, you know, Pratichi, what else? Uh, what else? What else do you want to share with folks at this, uh, you know, at this stage? You know, I think I think the main thing is um, dig dig in. Uh, we need to dig in on this. We need to dig in on this because, in the same way that that we have been living this societally societally for so long, our organizations many times are microcosms of society. So if we think as an organization that we're exempt or that we're already there, we've arrived at, at like a post-racial culture, it, that's not the case. That's just not the case. Um, so where do you wanna dig in? Where do you wanna dig in? Chances are good you are doing some version 
of looking at issues within your organization, whether it's your annual survey, if you do it annually or whatever, in which you can use that information to begin this journey. So dig in from where you are. It's one of those things of if you're waiting, if you're waiting for kind of the exact right time or further analysis to begin the journey, it, again, it, it's not it's not based solely on analysis. There is a p there is certainly information. There's data that needs to be understood. But if we're waiting for endless analysis to happen or to kind of point us to the right time, that's not going to happen. The intellectualism needs to be there. But again, as we said in the past, as we've said a few times during the course of our conversation, this is about emotional resonance and an emotional ownership and a moral obligation. So. Dig in, dig in wherever you are right now. What if I'm trying within my organization and I'm not the leader or I'm not even second or third tier management or something, you know, how do I elevate the conversation? Uh, I presume it helps to have allies. What if, what if I'm meeting a resistance from the people who, who are in leadership? I think look for the places where there may not be resistance, right? So look within the organization. Um, if there is resistance at a particular level, then you know who do you have access to in the organization where there isn't that? And I think I think starting out not assuming that you have solutions. If you have expertise in this area, if you have lived through the oppression as a member of a community that has lived through the oppression, particularly the Black community, I think you're coming from one place. If you are if you are not in that community and saying that you have expertise, I think you have to be a little bit more circumspect about that and, and introspective about what you can offer in this vein. Um, and I think, I think we want to look for the places where there is some traction. I think in most organizations, it's not unusual to be getting the question right now. And what is the, I don't want to call it outcome, What's, what, what, does, what can the future look like for our organization if we do embark on this long journey? Yeah, uh, cultures that are equitable in which people can show up as their whole selves, um, in which there is not only one right way to do things, which tends to be a very kind of white dominant, Western culture, linear sequential way of, of managing work, of managing communications, et cetera, but that in fact, work can be approached in a number of different ways and that solutions can be approached in a number of different ways. People get to show up and give their all to these missions that we all hold very near and dear. And so they are able, they're empowered, they are able, they are celebrated without sticking to a set of preconceived guidelines or preconceived unwritten or written rules that don't serve us anymore anyway. When you started to answer that, I saw your face lighten up. <laughs> you were, <laughs> you start, I don't know, it was a smile. It was just, looks like you're faced uh, untensed. Uh, not that you're nervous. <laughs> your, your, your face changed when you started to answer the where we could be. Uh, who, who doesn't like to imagine that, that future? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was palpable. All right. All right. Are you comfortable leaving it there? I or, think or, so. Okay. I think so. What have we not covered that we need to cover for your listeners? You know that better than I. Uh, mm. for, the, for the place they're at getting started. That's that's fair. Look, you know what, this is, this is a future that is written with many voices. And, and while I think I can be helpful, um, I don't presume to be the, the voice that has all the answers. I definitively don't. I definitively don't. And so what we have not covered is actually probably not known to me. But I dare say someone, someone out there does know that. And, and they will likely be putting their voice up, which is exactly what we want. Yes, we will be bringing other voices as well. All right. No doubt. Yeah. Pratishi Shah, she's founder and CEO of Flourish Talent Management Solutions, and the company is at flourishtms.com. Pratishi, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Tony, thank you. Thank you for opening up this space and having the conversation. It's a, a, a pleasure. Uh, it's a responsibility and mm. uh, happy to live up to it. Try, trying. We're sponsored by Wegner CPAs guiding you beyond the numbers, wegnercpas.com. By Cougar Mountain Software, 
The Nolly Fund is their complete accounting solution made for nonprofits. Tony.ma slash Cougar Mountain for a free 60 day trial. And by Turn2 Communications, PR and content for nonprofits. Your story is their mission. Turn 2.co. Our creative producer is Claire Meyerhoff. The show's social media is by Susan Chavez. Mark Silverman is our web guy. And this music is by Scott Stein. Many thanks to Susan and Mark for helping me get this special episode out to you quickly. Be with me next time, later this week, for Nonprofit Radio, big nonprofit ideas for the other 95%. Go out and be great. Woohoo! Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>